Really, the only thing we're going to do in this section is uh, solve these Ronskian test problems, just show you how easy it is. When you, when you look at that definition in a book, or even in the lecture, and uh, it's just a big matrix, a bunch of stuff written in there, looks really complicated. So let's, let's just take it one step at a time and do some problems. So let's say you have a differential equation. This is the kind of test problem you might have, actually. So let's say you have a differential equation. Now you can write it out in the normal way, but if we're going to use our nice operator notation, which is what you'll usually be doing when you get this far in your class, you might see it like this. The operator would be written as d squared minus a squared. Now remember, we talked about these linear differential operators. It's just a shorthand way of writing what you know. So if this is the linear differential operator, then the way you would write the differential equation in general would be L x is equal to zero. This is a homogeneous equation. So the right hand side is equal to zero. The left hand side is this operator times x. So if you can imagine this sitting here right in front of the x, it'll be the d squared times the x minus the a squared times the x. So you can go back and look at that lesson on linear differential operator if this isn't is this concept is not uh, so solid in your head. But this is generally most of the time how we're going to be writing our differential equations in the future. We'll be given a, a differential operator and then you'll just know that it's equal to zero if it's homogeneous. If it's equal to something else like on the a fun function of t or something on the right hand side, then it'll be uh, what we call non-homogeneous. So in this problem, let's say we are given, so this is the equation we're given, and let's say that we're also given the following. We're given that h1 of t is equal to e to the a t. So notice this is a up here and this is a here in one of these solutions. And let's say we're also given as h2 of t is equal to e to the minus a t. So don't forget what we're doing. We've got, remember these h1 and h2. So we have a general solution. So what we're really saying when, when, you're, when you're given this on a test, just out of the blue, or on a homework, when you're given a um, differential equation like this and you're given h1 and h2, what they're telling you without really telling you is that the general solution is really given to you as, as follows. x of t is equal to c1 h1 of t plus c2 h2 of t. Because remember, the general solution is just a linear combination. That's why we have constants in front. It's a linear combination of these functions here. Now we're also learned in the last section that these functions h1 and h2, in order to really form the general solution, they have to be what we call linearly independent. And the Ronskin test is, is exactly for that purpose, to prove that they're linearly independent. We're going to do that in just a second. But we also learned is that even though this big solution is a solution of this differential equation, each individual uh, of these h functions should also satisfy this equation. We learned that in the last section. So part one of this problem is to show, and this is a great test problem, you'll be given a differential equation, given an h1 and an h2, and the first part might say, uh, prove or show that these functions are solutions of this differential equation up there. So that's what I want to do first. I want to show that and just sort of kind of drill that in your head a little bit. So let's show that they're solu so solutions. Let's show that h1 and h2 are solutions to lx is equal to zero. Now you see how easy it is to write that? That's why we use this operator notation. Now what you should see when you read this is some derivatives here uh, operating on x is equal to zero. It's homogeneous because the zero's here. Everything is really wrapped up in the L, which is defined up here. That defines what our differential equation really looks like. So you can really have a lot of shorthand uh, goodness going on there to save you some time. Okay, so let's go and do that. Let's look at the first guy, h1. So what we have here is h1 of t is equal to e to the a t. Now notice that we have a second derivative here. So we know we're going to need two derivatives because it's operating on whatever we plug into the equation. We know we're going to have two derivatives. So let's go and take two derivatives. h1 prime of t. What is the derivative of this? Well, this is an exponential, so it's going to be a times e to the a t. The a just comes out because of the chain rule. Let's go ahead and take the second derivative because we know that we're going to end up using it. It's better just to get it out of the way up front. So we have the same thing. This is a constant times this function. So we're going to end up multiplying by a again. It's going to be a squared e to the a t. So we've gotten the second derivative of this guy. So now we need to turn our attention to actually plugging in this function of t 
into our differential equation. So our differential equation is LX is equal to zero, but L was defined to be D squared minus A squared operating on X is equal to zero. Okay, so this is our function of our, our, our function that we were basically solving for. And what we're trying to do is take this, this function and plug it in and see if it's satisfied. So we're going to plug in h of t right into here. So what we're going to have is d squared minus a squared um, multiplied uh, or operating on really uh, h1 of t. And I'm going to put equals with a question mark zero because we're trying to see if it really does satisfy it. So let's go ahead and plug it in. We have uh, d squared, let's go ahead and do the, the distribution right now. We'll have d squared, let's go ahead and distribute this guy in, h1 of t minus a squared h1 of t equals with a question mark zero. And I think now is about a good time as any to change colors to make it readable. What is h1 of t? Okay, whatever it is, which is this guy up here, we're taking the second derivative of it. That's what this d squared means. You can go back to the operator notation if that isn't clear. d squared means second derivative. Notice it's a lot easier to read this once you get used to it than having the, 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 the typical calculus notation of d squared x, dt squared, because then the fractions get in the way and everything gets kind of ugly. Here you can write everything on one line. You know you're taking the second derivative of this. We've already calculated that. So we're going to get a squared e to the a t right there minus here's a squared here times h1 which is just this e to the a t and look at this a squared e to the a t minus a squared e to the a t is equal to zero so check that does work so what we have done is we have taken one of these guys that were given to us in the problem we took its second derivative only because we knew we would need to, to use that in the course of this problem. We put our linear differential operator in, we plug in the function that we care about. You, you have to operate term by term. We take the second derivative, we multiply by this, and it turns out that it does satisfy the differential equation. I'm not going to do it here because it's so incredibly similar. You know, I'm all about doing example problems, but I think you can see that if we take the second function, the only difference between this one and this one is the negative sign. But I promise you that if you take the second derivative of this function, you're going to get, you know, uh, you're going to get the same sort of result. You're going to you're going to take the derivatives, you're going to put them in there, and you're going to find out that everything goes away. So this function also satisfies the differential equation. So in this particular case, I was this part of the problem. I wanted you to, sh to see that these functions really do satisfy individually the differential equation. So their linear combination, which is this also is going to satisfy that differential equation. But it's another question, even if they both satisfy the differential equation, it's another question if they're linearly independent or not. And if, they're, if they really do individually satisfy the equation, and if they truly are linearly independent, which means there's these, there are these fundamental solutions, then and only then do we say that it constitutes the general solution. So what we need to do is set up a Ronskian test to figure out if these two functions, h1 and h2, are linearly independent. So the way this would be worded on your test is you might be given these guys and it might ask you, is this linear combination, does it constitute the general solution of this differential equation? So when, it, when they're asking you to do something like figure out if it's linearly independent or figure out if it's generating the solution, you need to start thinking up, uh, thinking of Ronskian right away, okay? So here's how I do it. Now, when you write these on your own paper, you know, uh, you might come up with your own sort of shorthand way to show your work. What I'm doing is just showing you how I do it. Uh, the end result is really most important to know how to get there is most important. You may not show it exactly the way I'm showing every step, but that's what we're doing. We're learning here. So you can sort of make up your own mind. This is the way I write it. Um, when I'm going to do a Ronskin test, I'll do something like this. I'll say the Ronskin is equal to uh, the determinant, and I write that as DET and then I'll open up a matrix bracket. And I always spell everything out for myself so I don't get confused. So up at the top, I'll have H1 of T and H2 of T. So I write that across the top. Those are the only two functions I have. It's only a second order system. Underneath that, I know I'm gonna need H1 prime of T and H2 prime of T. Now, if you go back to the last section when we talked about what the Ronskian was, I told you, you write all of your H functions across, you start taking derivatives as you go down, and you continue taking them until you basically get a square matrix. Because you need a square matrix to, to do the determinant properly, right? So 
in this case, it's going to be two by two. You don't continue taking the second derivative and third derivative and making it a long vertical matrix because then it's not going to work. So you just keep on going until you have a square matrix is the bottom line. So this looks sort of complicated, um, but it's, it's really not. So let's just continue on. So I'm going to continue on over here, and I'm going to say this is equal to the determinant. Okay, and I'm going to start plugging in what I know. H1 was given e to the a t. H2 is e to the negative a t. Close my bracket. Down below, I need the first derivatives. Okay, the first derivative we calculated over here, and what's nice about it is you're looking at the original function above it, so you can sort of take the derivative and write it right below. So it's a e to the a t. This is the first derivative. Now look at this guy. Its first derivative is negative a e to the negative a t, and that's it. So we've got something that looks really complicated. We've got exponentials everywhere, negatives everywhere. It looks like it's really difficult, but let me show you something cool. The next thing you need to do is never forget that we need to evaluate this Ronskin at a time. Remember I told you in the last section, we evaluate it at some time, t naught. So uh, that time that you pick is really up to you. And this is where the technique comes into place. Most of the time, a lot of the time, you're just gonna use t is equal to zero. To evaluate it. But you can really pick any number you want within the, the range that your differential equations you know normally normal and well defined on and, and not you know uh, not not misbehaving itself so to speak from a differential equation point of view. This differential equation is well behaved all over the place. So really we just need to pick some value of t that's going to make these the, when we evaluate it make it easy. I mean we wouldn't want to pick t is equal to nine fifths of a second. We wouldn't want to pick t is equal to 1.444 because, yeah, we could evaluate it, but we're going to have all these exponentials everywhere, right? What we want to do is pick a number that makes our life easy. Zero usually is a good number because if you look at it, if you put zero into here, either the zero is one. So it becomes very easy. So write yourself a note. Uh, this is what I do when I get to this point. I say, I'm, just to tell your instructor, I'm eval, whoops, I misspelled eval. I'm evaling at t is equal to zero. So it's going to be equal to, Ron's skin is going to equal to the determinant of, okay, and just, you know, you can skip steps if you want, but I like to keep it clean. So I'm going to say e to the zero because I'm putting zero in for time, e to the zero over here because I'm putting zero into time. Down at the bottom, I'm going to have a e to the zero. And on the bottom right, I'm going to have negative a e to the zero. Now, you guys are all been doing math for a while, so you know that e to the zero is one. So in this step, you could just put one, one, and you could fill in the bottom. But, you know, for test purposes and for exam purposes, it's really not a bad idea to show everything so they know what you're doing. So here, you have the determinant of e to the zero is one, e to the zero is one. Here, I have e to the zero is one, but I have an a out in front, so I have an a e to the zero is one, I have a negative a, so I have negative a. Now we have kind of transformed this ugly beast down to a determinant of something that's not quite so bad. All of you have graphing calculators. Mo almost, if you don't, you really should already have one, either a Hewlett Packard or a Texas Instruments calculator. So you should all be able to stick this into a calculator and get the determinant. Um, you know, and when I do this course, sometimes I'm going to let you sort of do that yourself, but really I feel like I need to show you how to do it. So what we're going to do is calculate the determinant here. And even when we get to the three by three matrices, I'm going to show you how to calculate the determinant by hand there. But just keep in mind that if you really want to put this in your calculator and just get the determinant, you, you can do it. It just depends on, on, you know, how you want to run your, run your show. So here to calculate the determinant of a two by two matrix, don't forget, it's like a crisscross. It's like an X. You want to multiply this direction and then you want to have a subtraction and multiply the other way. So you can kind of think of it as a kind of a crisscross going like this. I think of it as an X. So it's going to equal to uh, going this direction, one times negative A, and then I have a minus sign, and then I go this way. So I go this way, and then I subtract going this way. One times A going this way. All right. So what I'm going to have is negative A minus A. So what I'm going to have is negative 2a. So this is the Ronskin. I mean, this is really the result you're looking for, but what does it mean? Remember back in the previous section, we said that if the Ronskin is not equal to zero, which in this case it's not, the Ronskin is not equal to zero. The only way it could be equal to zero is if a is equal to zero. And don't forget what a is. 
A is inside of our differential equation. So if A really is zero, then it's kind of silly for us to even do this problem because the differential equation is totally different and it's much simpler. So you can pretty much assume A is not going to be zero here, otherwise the problem would kind of be silly. So in this case, we figured out that the Ronskian is not equal to zero, right? So this means that this is the general solution of this differential equation. We have shown through substitution that both of these functions, well I didn't do the second one because it's so simple. The first one we've shown that it does satisfy the equation. You can prove to yourself that the second one behaves the same way. So both of these satisfy the differential equations. We've also used the Ronskian matrix to prove that both of these solutions are linearly independent of one another, which just means that you can't write one of these H functions in terms of the other one. It means that they're really truly separate and fundamental. So together they really can comprise the true uh, solution space of this equation. And the way you know that is when you get anything other than zero here. If we, if we would have gotten a big fat zero here, then you would write down that these were not linearly independent, that it did not comprise the general solution. So, you know, it's work. You know, it's definitely work, I'm not gonna lie to you there, but it's not crazy work, really. It's, it's, it looks very difficult when you first write that matrix down, uh, but it's really not that difficult when you work a few problems. So let's go and do another second order guy. And let's say our differential equation is d squared, or our linear operator, which is our differential equation, minus two times a times d plus a squared. Notice that the highest derivative is second derivative, then I have a first derivative here. I have some constants running around, but it's still second order. It still has uh, two, you know, uh, a second derivative here. And I'll give you a little hint. If your differential equation has two, a second order to it, a second derivative to it, then when you do your Ronskin, you're always going to have a two by two matrix, which means it's going to be super easy to evaluate it by hand. If you have a third order differential equation, your matrix is going to be larger, it's going to be three by three. Those are not that hard to evaluate by hand, but they're, they get a little more difficult. Uh, you might do it in your calculator if you have a three by three. If you get to fourth order and higher, you're going to have four by four matrix or five by five matrix to take a determinant of. Uh, you really want to do that in your calculator just because it's, it's not possible, it's just hard to do that stuff by hand. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of giving you a little roadmap so you know what to expect. So let's say this is our differential equation and given to us, on our test, we are given h1 of t, which is e to the a t, and h2 of t, which is different than last time, t e to the a t. This is different, so it's t times e to the a t. And the question is, uh, you know, we're not gonna plug these in anymore. If you were to do that, we did that in the first one just to show you, but if you take this guy, you plug it into your differential equation, it will satisfy the homogeneous equation uh, Lx is equal to zero, which is what we have. Lx is equal to zero. That's a differential equation. We're always working with homogeneous equations, right? So L operating on x is equal to zero. If you were to take it and plug it in, you'd get zero. If you were to take this and plug it in, you would get zero. So it's given at the outset of this problem that these are solutions, but the question is, are they linearly independent or not? So we need to do the Ronskian for that. So what we do is we just write big W. Ronskian is going to be equal to and then we write down our functions that we have. The first one is e to the a t. The second one is t e to the a t. Now underneath we take the derivative, first derivative. So here we have the same thing from before, a e to the a t. Okay? Here it's a little more complicated because we have a t out front, so we need a chain rule. So what we're going to have is just to keep it squared away, um, no pun intended on the square matrix, but just to keep it you know, straight, I'm going to put a parentheses here and do the chain rule. So I'm going to say uh, t times the derivative of the second part, which is a e to the a t plus the second part e to the a t times the derivative of the first part, uh, which is just one. So you can sort of not even put the one in there. Make sure you understand this. This is nothing more than a chain rule. First times the derivative of the second, which is this, plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay, so that's all we really have. So we have an ugly looking matrix. Now we need to evaluate it at some value and function of time that's gonna make it easy for us. We can use any function of any, any value of time we want as long as our differential equation is well behaved at that value. Um, you could pick 1.9, you could pick 17, you could pick anything you want, but zero is gonna again give us a simple, simple uh, reduction here. So what we're gonna have is the determinant 
okay, of the following matrix. Let's go ahead and put zero in here. So we have e to the zero. Here we're going to have zero times e to the zero. Here we're going to have a e to the zero. And in here, let's just keep it straight by saying we have zero a e to the zero plus e to the zero. And again, you guys are big boys and girls, so you could probably do this all in your head. I'm just, I like to show all the work, so that's what we're going to do here. So we have the determinant of the following matrix. Here we have a 1. Here we have a 0. Here we have an A. Here, this is 0 here because of this 0, but this is 1. So we're going to have 1 out here. So we should get 1, 0, A, 1. So we've reduced this ugly looking thing down to a very simple 2 by 2 matrix. So we take the determinant of this guy. Crisscross, we go this way first, then we go this way. So going this way, 1 times 1 minus 0 times A. Okay, so what we get is the Rontzkin is equal to 1. Right, so the Rontzkin is equal to 1. So because the Rontzkin is not equal to 0, this is the general solution. So what we have proven is it's the general solution of this differential equation. And we've also proven, because the Ronskin test serves the same purpose, and it's the same sort of thing, that these are truly linearly independent from one another. Now just take a gander back to what we have. This is function one, this is function two. It kind of makes sense that you're not able to write one of them in terms of a linear combination of the other one. This has a t in front. So there's really no way I can use this function multiplied by something to give me this and vice versa. So like I say, sometimes you can look at them and sometimes you can't. And another thing you might think when you, when you do this section uh, here in, in differential equations as well, you might think to yourself, I can look at these and see that they're not, that, that they are linearly independent. So what's the big deal? Why do I need this Ronskin test to show me that? I mean, I can look at this and just decide for myself that they're not, that I can't write one of these in terms of the other one. Um, true, but what if you have a sixth order differential equation? What if you have you know, six h of t functions. What if you, once you graduate school, uh, go off and become an aerospace engineer and you're modeling the, the, the airflow over a wing and you might have 14 variables, right? And so you have a big giant differential equation with 14 variables. Maybe you'd like to know if that solution really is truly the full solution or not. So yeah, when we're doing these problems here, you might be able to figure out for yourself if these are linearly independent functions or not. But in the real world, when things are not so pretty and you have a million terms running around, having a nice, beautiful matrix that has been proven to always tell you if, it's, if it gives linear, linear independence is really important and really, and, you know, really um, something you want to know because you can program a computer to calculate this. And so then you can, you can use the computer tools to do it, but you have to know where it all comes from. So that's why we spend some time in differential equations so you know what we're doing. In the real world, um, when things are not so beautiful with these simple equations, then, you know, it's much, much more useful. Okay, let's look at our next problem. And let's say this is our differential equation. Let's say we have d cubed minus 2d squared operating on x is equal to 0. So this is our linear differential operator L operating on x. It's homogeneous, so we have it equal to zero. And let's look at our three functions uh, that we're investigating here. H1 is just one. It's a function of time, it's just a constant. H2 is equal to t, and H3 is equal to two t minus three. So we have three different um, functions. Notice it's third order. So we have to have three functions so that what we're really saying here is we have the general solution is a linear combination of these three functions here. So constant times this function plus constant times this function plus constant times this function comprises the general solution. Question is, is it really the whole general solution? Are they really linearly independent from one another? So let's set up the Ronskin test to figure that out. So the Ronskin is going to equal to the determinant of the following matrix. So we put our functions right across the top. One is this function. This function is t. This function is 2t minus 3. Let me close that off. Now we start taking derivatives. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of t is 1. The derivative of this is just 2. 
And then now notice we need a square matrix, right? So before we had two by twos. Well, now we have three guys, so we have to do another derivative. The derivative of zero is zero. Derivative of one is zero. Derivative of two is zero. So we've got our nice square matrix. So basically you keep taking those derivatives until you have a square matrix. All right, now we need to figure out what number are we gonna evaluate this matrix at? Or we need to pick a number. I will kind of keep telling you and giving you a big hint, zero is gonna be a nice number because it'll put zero here and zero for this term, so it'll simplify everything. So eval, eval at t is equal to zero, then the Ronskin is gonna to equal to the determinant of the following thing. One, zero in here, zero here, two t is zero, I'm gonna have negative three left over. This is zero, and everything else we just copy. Zero, zero, zero. Okay, so now we have a real matrix with real numbers. Now again, here's the point where, <clears throat> you know, if you're in a class and you're really crunched for time and you get down to this point, you can stick this in a calculator, put the matrix in, take the determinant, you'll get a number. If the number is not zero, then this is the full solution. If the number is zero for that determinant, then these guys were not linearly independent at all. Okay, um, so to take a determinant, what you have to do on your paper or mentally is do the following. In the first column, above the first column, put a little plus sign, not inside of the matrix, but just on top. Then put a minus sign, then put a plus sign. The theory as to why you need these pluses and minuses is beyond the scope of what I want to teach you. It goes into matrix theory. It goes into the cofactors and all the stuff that, that and the theory of matrix algebra. I'm not getting into that now. For three by three, you just put plus, minus, plus. That's all you have to remember, and it's always that way. No, no matter what three by three you have, it's always plus, minus, plus. You have to remember the minus sign there. All right, then how we're going to do this is really kind of cool. The determinant is equal to the following thing. What we're going to do first is, is cross out this column here. All right, and when I say cross it out, you're gonna mentally cross it out. You don't actually draw a line through it. So with your pencil, just kind of put a line over this. The top guy in the top is a one. Uh, the, the top number here in the first column here is one. So put a one right, because that's what's here. And then you're gonna multiply it by the determinant of the following matrix. If you cross this out, you have to cross the intersecting guy out also. So this is the intersecting row that intersects with this right here. So notice we take this and we put it here. Because we do that, we cross this out, we cross this out. All we are left with are these four terms. So we're taking the determinant of one, two, zero, zero. Because these are what is left over. Let me finish before you start asking a lot of questions and you'll see where we're going with this. Next, we need to do the same thing to the middle column, but since we have a minus sign, you need to put a minus here. That's why that's why we do that, just to remind yourself of that fact. Now, because we're working with the middle column, put your marker over this and over this. So we've crossed out this. The only numbers left are these two and these two. So we write that as, we have a zero here, so we have to put a zero in the front times the determinant of whatever is really left over is what we're doing. Zero, zero, two, zero. Zero, zero, two, zero. Okay? The final guy, we're using this column, so we're marking this out. We have a negative three up here. It's plus, that's true, but the number itself is negative three. So we'll have negative three times the, the determinant of, if we cross these guys out, the only thing left are these four. Zero, one, zero, zero. Zero, one, zero, zero. Very important that you understand what I've done, because this is it. Notice that what we've done is we've taken a three by three matrix and we've reduced it to a bunch of easy, easy two by two matrices. I know you can take the determinant of this. I know you can take the determinant of this. I know you can take the determinant of this. So you know how to do this stuff. And we're gonna do that math here in just a second, but it's more important for you to understand where we got it from. When you have a three by three matrix, you put these reminder columns up there to remind you that there's a plus one out, plus sign out here. You're working with the first column, so you take the one and put it out there and you cross this off like this and write a determinant of everything else that's left over. Then you go to the middle column. You take the zero and put it out front, but you have a, a negative sign here that you always have to remember, so you stick that out front. We cross these off and the determinant is whatever is left over here. So you put that in there. Then the third column, it's a plus sign, but the number itself is negative three, so we put negative three out. We cross this off and take the determinant of what's left over right there, okay? So let's go and switch colors and just show you how easy it is to do this. So the determinant is equal to, here we have a one, 
right? And then on the inside, we have literally one times zero is gonna give me zero minus two times zero, which is gonna give me zero. So I have zero minus zero right in there. So it's one times zero minus two times zero. Over here, we have a zero multiply. It doesn't even matter what this determinant is. There's a big fat zero out there. So there's, there's just a zero for the second term. For the third term, we have a negative three, and we have to take the determinant of this guy, which is crisscross like this. Zero times zero gives me zero. One times zero gives me zero. So I have a zero there. So look what we have. The determinant is, I have a zero here, I have a zero here, I have a zero here. So the Ronskin is equal to zero exactly. And what did we say happens if the Ronskin is equal to zero? It means these are not linearly independent, which means they do not form the, the whole entire general solution. They are not fundamental functions. Somehow, some way, they are not totally separable from one another, and we'll see how in just a second, but basically the Ronskin test tells you that these particular three functions cannot form the whole entire general solution. Uh, now, you might look at this and you might say, well, why would I ever do that? I have a calculator, you know? Uh, true. I mean, that's absolutely true. You can just stick this in a guy, get the determinant, and you'll skip yourself right down to here and get the answer. If you're fine with that, that's okay. However, there's something to be said for if you have the time on a test, showing your work is always going to give you more points than not showing your work. Always. If you get the wrong answer and you've completely skipped this, then as a teacher, I'm not going to know if you know anything at all about what you're doing when you take a determinant. I mean, I'm not going to know if you keyed in the wrong numbers. I'm not going to know if you know how to use your calculator. I'm not going to know anything. But if I see all of this, I can see, well, this, this person really kind of knows what they're doing. They just make a little mistake here. Okay, I'll give them most of the credit there. So if you have time, I recommend doing this and also, when you get into other classes, knowing how to take a determinant of a three by three matrix is really important. Uh, I should say it's really useful because um, we live in a three dimensional world. So when you take a cross product of three uh, of a, of a you know x y z x y z you know vectors or something like that, then um, you know you can do it in a computer. But knowing how to do it by hand is really really useful when you get into more advanced classes. That's all I'm going to really say about it. And you can use this technique to do that. And I teach that, in fact, in the, uh, in the advanced calculus DVDs when we talk about vector products. Okay, um, now let's talk about this guy right here. We've proven that it's not linearly independent. Why is that? Let's look up here and investigate our functions. Notice what we have, and you may have noticed this when we started. H3 is 2 times t minus 3. This function is t. So if we were to have been sharp enough, actually I could have told you, I just didn't really want to tell you at the time. H3 can be written as 2 times H2 minus 3. It can be written as a linear combination of the other guys, right? Think about it. 2 times T, 2 times H2, which is T, minus 3. So the third function truly is not really independent from the other two. It can be written in terms of the other two. Therefore, it cannot be uh, a part of the general solution of this differential equation. It just doesn't work out that way. So what I want to do next, and I think it's a great supplement to this problem, let's go and do the exact same differential equation with slightly different guys and see what we get from the rod scan. So let's move over here. I'm not going to erase that board, but we're going to use exactly the same differential equation. So d cubed minus 2d squared operating on x is equal to 0. Same differential equation. Nothing has changed. Um, let me switch colors here. H1 of t is exactly the same as before. It's number 1. Uh, H2 of t is equal to t. Same as before. Nothing has changed. H3 of t is equal to something different. E to the 2t. So really all we have done from this part this board to the last board, it's the same differential equation, same first function, same second function, but the third one, the one that we figured out was kind of not right, we've changed it. So now we will see what happens. And I think you can kind of tell by looking at this, this is so different that these should all be linearly independent. Let's see what the Ronskin test tells us. So the Ronskin is equal to the determinant of the following matrix. You just write your functions, one, t, and e to the 2t. Then take a derivative. The derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of t is 1. Derivative of this is 2 times e to the 2t. 
we need to make a square matrix, so we keep and take another derivative. The derivative of zero is zero. Derivative of this is zero. Derivative of this, we're gonna end up multiplying. We'll have four e to the two t. Okay? So let's take this guy, but let's evaluate it. Let's, uh, let me go over here. Let's evaluate it at t naught is equal to zero. You can pick anything you want, but you'll see that with these exponentials everywhere, it's, it's just gonna make it easier. So we have a one here, t here, which we're plugging in zero, so we're gonna zero. Here we're gonna have e to the zero. Here we're gonna have zero and then one. Here we're gonna have two e to the zero. Here we're gonna have zero and zero. Here we're gonna have four e to the zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and simplify this guy, the determinant of the following matrix. One, zero, e to the zero is one over there. Zero, one, two times one gives me two. Zero, zero, four times one gives me four. So now I have a nice simple three by three matrix that I can easily work with. And especially it makes it easy when I have zeros everywhere because these determinants are gonna be much easier in those cases. So, you can put this in your calculator and take the determinant and get the answer. That's fine. I'm gonna give you a little practice. Put yourself a plus, minus, plus. All right? And then we're gonna say that this determinant is equal to uh, the following thing. All right, the, the determinant of this matrix. First, we work in the first column like this. So this one is going to come out times the determinant of the following two by two matrix. We just cross these guys over. We're left with these four here. One, two, zero, four, like that. Now we work in the middle column, we have a minus sign. We also happen to have a zero. So we put it as zero times the determinant of, we cross these out. The only thing left are these two and these two. So we have zero, two, zero, four, right there. Finally, we work in the third column, we have this one times the determinant of, we cross this out, we have 0, 1, 0, 0. 0, 1, 0, 0. All right, now we have a more complicated 3 by 3 in terms of a bunch of very easy 2 by 2s. Okay? So what we're going to have is the Ronskin is going to be equal to, now we'll have 1. Now let's take this determinant. 1 times 4 gives us 4. Minus 2 times 0 gives us 0. Okay, over here, we have a zero out front, so it doesn't even matter what this is. And then here we have plus one. And on the inside here, we have zero minus zero. So we have a zero minus zero. So the Ronskin here is going to be equal to, this is zero, this is zero. Over here we have four times one gives us four. So the Ronskin in this case is equal to four. So because of that, we'll just draw a conclusion. The Ronskin is not equal zero. So these are linearly independent, and because of that, they are and they do form the general solution of this differential equation. So look how cool this is. We have the same differential equation. In this case, it kind of makes sense. We can take one of these guys and rewrite it in terms of the other two. So the Ronskin test fails, not linearly independent. Here we have the same equation, slightly different third guy, do the Ronskin test and show that it's not equal to zero, so these are linearly independent. These guys do form the true and total general solution of this differential equation. And um, you know it's really not that hard. It looks hard in the books because of the way it's written, but you just put your functions, take your derivatives. Doing this determinant gives a lot of people problems. You can use your calculator. I'm trying to show you some nice tricks uh, to do it here, uh, but we'll be good to go. What I want to do now is work one more problem. Uh, just to give you practice with uh, one more, and we'll call it a day. So let's say we have a linear differential operator of d cubed minus 4d, right? And let's say our functions uh, for lx is equal to 0, because it's homogeneous, our functions h1 of t, let's say, is e to the 2t, let's say h2 of t is equal to e to the minus 2t, and let's say h3 of t is equal to 1. All right, so let's go and form our 
Ron skin. So what we'll have is equal to the determinant of, let's write our functions down, e to the 2t, e to the negative 2t, and then I have 1 right here. Now just to keep this matrix from getting ugly, I'm going to sort of switch colors and separate the rows because we're going to have a lot of exponentials. Take the derivative of this, I'm going to get 2e to the 2t. Take the derivative of this, I'm going to have negative 2e to the negative 2t. Take the derivative of this, I'm going to have 0. And I'll switch back to black just to separate the third line. The derivative of this, because the 2 is out front, is going to be 4e to the 2t. The derivative of this, negative times negative, gives me positive 4e to the negative 2t. The derivative of this is 0. So we've got our Ronskin set up. It's 3 by 3. We took the derivatives till we get 3 by 3. Now let us eval at, I mean, 0 is going to work again, so we'll do t is equal to 0. So this is going to equal to the determinant of the following. We have e to the 0 here. Okay, so we'll have e to the 0. We have e to the 0 here. We'll have 1 over here. Here we have 2 times e to the 0. Here we have negative 2 e to the 0. Here we have 0 over here. Here we have 4 times e to the 0. Here we have 4 times e to the 0. And here we have 0. Okay, now I think we can write down the matrix in its full glory. We need the determinant of, and the top will have e to the 0 is 1. 1, 1. Over here we'll have 2, and we'll have negative 2, and we'll have 0. Here we'll have 4, 4, 0. Okay, now we are ready to actually take the determinant. So again, put this 3 by 3 in your calculator, get a number. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. But let me give you a little practice with doing these determinants. Plus, minus, plus. Just write yourself a little reminder on top. And what we'll have is the Ron scheme is going to be equal to Let's work in the first column first. We have a 1 here, so we'll pull it out, multiply by the determinant of, cross this guy out, we're left with these four down here. Negative 2, 0, 4, 0. Okay. We have a minus sign, so we have a minus working in this middle column, so we have a 1 times the determinant. Cross this out, 2, 4, 0, 0. 2, 4, 0, 0. And then finally, for the third one, we have a 1, so we'll stick a 1 out here, times the determinant, cross these out, we'll have these four over here. So we'll have 2, negative 2, 4, 4. I chose this problem for a couple of reasons. One, uh, in the previous ones we did, we ended up having a 0 here. It was just because of the problem. Now we actually don't have a 0 here, so we'll get practice with that. And secondly, there are fewer zeros overall, so I have to actually you know, calculate the determinant a little more carefully here. So let's go ahead and find it. This Ron scan is going to equal to 1. What is the determinant of this going to be? Let's crisscross this way. This is going to be 0, uh, zero minus 0. So it's going to literally be 0 minus 0, just like before, minus 1 times the determinant of this matrix. This multiplied gives me 0 minus 0 here. So 0 minus 0 here. So far it's pretty simple. And then at the end we'll have this guy. So here we have 2 times 4 gives us 8, right? Minus negative 2 times 4, so it's minus, because you determinants always have a minus sign, negative 8, like this. So I think you can see the Ron scan. This is going to give me 0. This is going to give me 0. This is 8 plus 8, so this is actually 16. So the Ron scan for this answer is actually 16, which does not equal 0, so which means that these form the general solution. In other words, they're linearly independent. And you can kind of see that by looking up here. Uh, you can't write any of these in terms of the other two. These are similar, but the exponent's negative. You certainly can't write one in terms of the other, uh, and you can't do it with the third one either. But again, the Ronskian test is, is the bulletproof way, the way that works for all equations, no matter what the order. And that's why we learn it in differential equations. Uh, so we've learned a lot in this section. I know that the first time I read about the Ronskian matrix, it looked really hard, really difficult. 
Uh, it's usually the way it's written in the book because you've, you've got a matrix, a determinant going on, lots of derivatives of arbitrary functions in there, and it's easy to get a little lost as to what it's for. Well, I'm trying to tell you what it's for. It's just to help us determine if, if we think we found the solution of a differential equation, uh, or do they form the general solution, which means are they linearly independent from one another? And that's the most important thing. That's what the Ronsky and Tails helps us uh, determine. So just take your functions, put them in there, take your derivatives to get a square matrix, take the determinant. If you want to use your calculator for that, that's fine. I've tried to show you with three or four different examples how to do a determinant of a three by three matrix. I think it is an important skill, otherwise I wouldn't teach it to you. You'll, you'll use it in more advanced calculus, you'll use it in engineering. Um, it's just a useful thing to know, mainly because we live in a three-dimensional world. So the three by three matrix pops up quite a bit. You get up into four by fours and five by fives, I mean, you're not going to do that as often, plus it's much more cumbersome, so I probably would use a computer or a calculator for anything above a three by three. But personally, I like the satisfaction of seeing where I get. When I get the answer, I can always go back and plug that determinant in, get the answer, and make sure I've done my math correctly, so you're bulletproof on that as long as you have time on your exam. I'm Jason with MathTutorDVD.com. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Watch it a few times. Make sure you understand how to apply this Ronskian test. Most importantly, make sure you understand what it's for because I can guarantee you it will be on your exams. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.